Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, good morning to everybody. All right, so uh, I'm specifically invited to talk about proton therapy, but I think some of the principles that I'm going to be talking about, and essentially expanding the role of radiation for salvage therapy and as definitive therapy for people who are not surgical candidates, uh, can be applied to any advanced radiation modality, including IMRT or in some cases stereotactic body radiation therapy. So I'll make references to those as well. Um, my disclosures are NIH and National Science Foundation funding. All right, so what are the reasons to administer radiation in general, regardless of protons or photons? One is certainly for palliation. About 60% of all mesothelioma patients will receive palliative radiation uh, to either help with pain or to stop bleeding or help with uh, dyspnea, cough, wheezing. Um, the other thing that's a little bit more controversial, uh, radiation historically had been used more frequently to try to prevent instrument uh, track recurrences. So essentially, like sarcomas, this is a, a malignancy where there's a potential for the tumor to seed along any instrument track. So whether it's a biopsy site, a surgical site, uh, there are higher rates of the tumor seeding along that. There have been several trials that have looked at can radiation reduce the incidence of this. A little bit of a mixed picture. And so standards of care generally in Europe and particularly the United Kingdom, uh, most patients are receiving prophylactic radiation. Most patients in the U.S. do not. Uh, but, but there is some evidence that it may help with that as well. So a big area is after surgery, and, and so these are trimodality patients. So patients that have a lung, spare, uh, a lung removal surgery, an extra pleural pneumonectomy, most of those patients uh, who recover and have a good performance status after surgery will receive radiation therapy. So a typical sequence will be take out the lung, get chemotherapy, and get radiation therapy. Radiation is easy to deliver in those patients because the lung is out, so now we're essentially irradiating an open chest cavity. Yes, we have to be careful about dose to the heart, dose to the esophagus, uh, and even the liver and kidneys since the diaphragm goes so low. Uh, but the biggest reason that we have trouble delivering radiation therapy for mesothelioma is the lung. And if the lung is removed, we aren't at risk of developing radiation pneumonitis or, or other complications to the lung from radiation. In patients that have a, a lung sparing surgery, so an extended pleurectomy decortication, giving radiation is a lot more challenging. Uh, we are seeing an increased use in whole pleural radiation in people with lung sparing surgery, so I'll talk about that. Uh, and regardless of the surgery, in patients that have gross residual disease after surgery, it does make sense to at least give focal radiation to those areas. Uh, we've started using radiation more for patients with multiple lymph nodes that are positive at the time of surgery, and I'll talk about that a little bit more as well. And then I want to introduce the concept of definitive radiation or, or salvage radiation uh, to provide local control for non-surgical candidates in, in the sense of definitive radiation uh, or in patients that are progressing on systemic therapy or after uh, surgery using salvage radiation. So, you know, radiation, it's not unique and, and many people in this room are, are aware of radiation after a lung removal surgery. So I just want to spend a minute talking through why potentially we're seeing uh, an increased use of lung sparing surgery and what that means for radiation. Well, we know there have been several reports in the last few years, including uh, individual institutions that have shifted from doing more lung removal to lung sparing surgeries, as well as uh, earlier this year in, in our own publication in the National Cancer Database, we're just seeing more lung sparing surgeries, primarily because of a toxicity benefit. Uh, so there are fewer toxicities and, and a lower perioperative mortality when doing a lung sparing surgery. Better preservation of quality of life and pulmonary function tests. We've shown uh, when I was at Penn that there's better preservation of pulmonary function, certainly when you compare it to an extra pleural pneumonectomy. Um, and then patients generally seem to be better able to tolerate salvage therapy. So a patient that's just gone through an aggressive trimodality approach or, or has had complications after an extra pleural pneumonectomy, they may not be as good of a candidate to undergo aggressive uh, multi-agent chemotherapy afterwards. There is a suggestion that there can be a benefit in overall survival as too with a lung sparing surgery. Uh, these are four um, th uh, thoracic surgeons, all prominent in the field, who have reported on their own experience of an extra pleural pneumonectomy uh, and then compared it to their own experience of a, an extended pleurectomy decortication of lung sparing surgery. And you can see three out of the four had a, an actual, at least numeric, survival benefit when they moved more toward doing a lung sparing surgery. That does give us a lot more problems than radiation, though. Uh, so we know that radiation has a role in the adjuvant setting. It's been used after extrapleural pleural pneumonectomies uh, and has been shown to change the patterns of failure in patients uh, 
after surgery. So comparing patients that have surgery and chemotherapy alone versus surgery, radiation and chemotherapy, we see a higher rate of distant metastatic disease as opposed to a local or, or plural or nodal recurrence when you incorporate radiation. So how can we incorporate radiation safely in the adjuvant setting to try to sterilize any residual disease in patients that have a lung sparing surgery? Well, this was recently published in, in 2016. Uh, this was a, a Memorial Sloan Kettering MD Anderson analysis looking at the use of IMRT after a lung sparing surgery and after chemotherapy to see if the use of IMRT can be done safely. Now, I will say uh, the first uses of intensity modulated radiation therapy for mesothelioma uh, didn't go well. So for, for non-radiation oncologists in the room, essentially what IMRT allows us to do is to, to modulate the intensity of radiation across the width of a radiation beam. So instead of a uniform sort of blast from front to back of 100% of, of the radiation dose, um, IMRT essentially allows us to curve the radiation along normal tissues since we can say, we want less dose and we can use a computer to tell us how do we deliver radiation to give less dose to the lung and the esophagus and the heart compared with the lining of the lung. Uh, the first use of IMRT was done by uh, the Dana-Farber in Boston. They treated 13 patients after a, a, an extra pleural pneumonectomy. They actually had six patients die from fatal radiation pneumonitis. So it really does underscore the importance of really being careful with your lung constraints. Uh, so this group really was very careful. They did a prospective trial using very rigid lung constraints uh, and you know, two centers of excellence for mesothelioma, Memorial and MD Anderson, and they did show it can be done safely with IMRT. So they enrolled 45 patients. Not all of them went on to receive the, the complete treatment, either because of progression or a refusal of treatment, but they did treat 27 patients with this trimodality approach, a lung sparing surgery with intensity modulated radiation therapy. And, and they went down from you know, about half of patients dying in the early Harvard experience uh, to no grade four and five toxicities. You can see the, the, the high grade toxicities were pretty mild here. And the survival is pretty encouraging. Two year survival for this relatively advanced patient population, progression free survival is a little over a year. So it does suggest that you can deliver radiation with a, an intact lung, at least relatively safely, but can we do even better than this? And do we need to do adjuvant radiation in every single patient? There's an interesting approach uh, using neoadjuvant radiation therapy that's been uh, reported several times by the Princess Margaret and University of Toronto group, where they're giving a high dose radiation followed by a lung removal surgery. So in that case, every single patient's getting radiation, every single patient then goes on and gets surgery. In the Memorial and MD Anderson experience, every single patient that could tolerate it was getting radiation. Can we see, does radiation need to be delivered in every single patient that has an extra pleural pneumonectomy or a lung sparing surgery, or should we use radiation more selectively? The benefit of adjuvant radiation is we can tailor radiation to the high risk patients that may benefit from radiation the most. We know there are several favorable prognostic factors, so perhaps some of these patients may not have as much benefit from radiation therapy, so certainly epithelial histology does better, younger age, good performance status. Early stage disease, that's going to be an important one that I'll come back to. Uh, and you can see the rest of the favorable prognostic factors. Those factors have been uh, validated by a couple of different cooperative groups, first the CalGB and then also the EORTC showing that essentially advanced age, poor performance status, and then these other factors including platelet counts being high, uh, white counts being low, that's associated with worse overall survival. We've tried to be uh, a little bit more selective in our role of radiation too. So this is uh, a publication we had last year from when uh, myself and Joe Freeberg were at University of Pennsylvania. We're now in Maryland together, but we reported on 90 consecutive patients that we operated on that we thought had epithelial histology. You heard Dr. Cameron mention earlier that he had a patient where he thought it was 100% epithelial and then 60% of the tumor ended up being sarcomatoid. Uh, we found that to be the case that 17 out of the 90 patients we operated on had biphasic histology. When we looked at the, the 73 remaining patients with pure epithelial histology, we treated all these patients with a lung sparing surgery, adjuvant chemotherapy, and then select use of radiation therapy. So only a minority got radiation, but we generally tried to do radiation to the higher risk patients. Uh, they were all a relatively advanced patient population. 89% had AJCC uh, stage three or four disease. More than two thirds of them had mediastinal nodes that were involved. And these were large tumors too. Uh, median tumor volume was over 550 milliliters. Uh, what we saw is the median overall survival for this cohort was three years, so a, a pretty prolonged overall survival. Uh, 
Um, despite a median progression rate survival only being about 1.2 years, which is similar to other reports, the overall survival is longer than other reports. Um, and I think that has to do somewhat with our role of salvage radiation that I'll come back to in a minute. But specifically, when we look at our, our node um, N0 patients, so all the patients that didn't have N2 disease, there was only 19 patients in this cohort. We didn't use radiation in any of those patients. Uh, and our median overall survival in that cohort was 7.3 years. So we essentially were trying to use radiation to take the high-risk patients and make them still have a three-year survival. Uh, but the early stage patients, we didn't think we needed to have a benefit for radiation with. We tried to be a little bit creative and looking at some new prognostic factors beyond the simple histology, age, gender. And so these are two publications we have in press right now. On the left, you can see we looked at our tumor volume of our entire cohort. And you can see that the median here was in the 500 plus range. Uh, we had several patients below that, but you know, some really large, over two liters of disease at the time of surgery. When we broke out the tumor volumes in tertiles, so these patients had the smallest volume of disease, an intermediate volume, and the largest volume of disease, you can see the survival very clearly separates for those patients. When we looked at it uh, just above or below the median, we saw the same separation, and in quartiles, the same separation. So it's, it's very, very true and true that the tumor volume really impacts survival in this disease. The other thing that we've looked at, and this is now incorporated into the new staging system that you just heard in, in the last couple talks, uh, posterior intercostal lymph nodes. So this was previously not part of the staging. It was generally either if you had hyalur lymph nodes or mediastinal lymph nodes. Um, but we've recognized that intraoperatively, Joe Freeberg found posterior intercostal lymph nodes uh, that were positive in some of our patients. Even in patients that had other significant lymph node disease, if they had a positive posterior intercostal lymph node, those patients had a lot worse survival than if they had negative. And in the early stage patients, we saw some patients that only had a posterior intercostal lymph node and no other disease in lymph nodes, and those patients did worse. So we moved and shifted to, say, if they have uh, posterior intercostal lymph nodes positive, if they have a lot of N2 lymph nodes positive, or if they have large tumor volumes, we want to take that inferior survival and try to use radiation to push the survival and make it even better. In doing so, we end up treat lar treating large volumes. How can we do that as safely as possible? Well, you, you saw that Memorial and MD Anderson are starting to be able to do it safely with IMRT, but can we do it even safer than that? There are three main types of radiation that are in use today. The, the one that 99% of patients get is photon therapy. That's the, the standard X-ray radiation that you, you generally think about. Electrons are generally only used for very superficial things, uh, like a rib metastasis, for instance, in a mesothelioma patient or invasion into the chest wall superficially. Uh, and we'll talk about protons, but all three, all three of them essentially work the same way, using ionization to cause DNA damage of the tumor. So I apologize, this is a relatively complicated physics slide, but I'll try to explain this so you understand why protons are a little bit different than everything else. Uh, so if we're trying to cheat, uh, treat, for instance, uh, the pleura that's 20 centimeters deep into a patient, if we use traditional radiation, which is this line, uh, and we want to give 100% of the radiation dose to that area, generally it takes a couple of centimeters uh, of, of radiation in the body to build up to get to 100% of the radiation dose. And then as the radiation travels to an area that we want to treat, you're actually losing radiation. So by the time it gets to where you want to go, you're not delivering all the radiation. The reason it's losing some is throughout this whole path, the radiation is being deposited in your normal tissues. So in a mesothelioma patient, that's the normal lung. Uh, in some cases, that's the heart, the esophagus, etc. With proton therapy, we can send radiation in uh, generally at a lower dose to the skin, so patients don't have as much skin redness that you generally think of with, with uh, photon radiation therapy. And because it's a heavy charged particle, we can use magnets to tell it exactly where to deposit all the radiation. So now we can get 100% of the radiation where we want it to. And the biggest difference now is all the radiation stops at that point. So you don't have any radiation beyond that. So what that really looks like is you have less radiation before the tumor, you essentially get the same amount of radiation at the tumor, and now you have zero radiation beyond the tumor. So if, if you're trying to spare, for instance, the contralateral lung beyond the tumor and the ipsilateral lung and esophagus before the tumor, you can have a potential benefit there. So this is the first patient we used protons for at, when I was back at Penn. Uh, this was now about five years ago. This patient uh, had a, an, extra, uh, excuse me, an extended pleurectomy decortication and had a pretty significant recurrence right in the front near the pericardium, it was tried on two lines of systemic therapy, and he continued to have just this isolated sort of recurrence after surgery, but, but continued to get bigger and bigger, started to have some cardiac symptoms. 
uh, we decided to, to treat, we were going to use IMRT, but you can see in treating this area, I was giving radiation dose to the entire volume of the heart, some of the liver, some of the esophagus were, were going to get irradiated, and certainly both lungs were getting some degree of radiation. Uh, so I said, why don't I try to use proton therapy? Uh, we sent radiation and we hit the tumor, all the radiation stopped there, so now two-thirds of the heart got spared. The patient would never have any trouble with swallowing because the esophagus was completely spared. Uh, and this patient did quite well, so ended up living for about three and a half years from the time of this recurrence. We ended up using three different courses of proton therapy to treat these isolated areas of progression. So it's one thing to treat small volumes. Can we use protons to treat large volumes, and how does it compare to sort of the advanced use of IMRT with the photon world? Well, it may be pretty favorable there, too. So this is a nice example. Um, you know, IMRT, if we're trying to treat uh, an entire hemithorax, you're still giving some volume of heart, in, uh, some degree of dose to the entire volume of the heart. Certainly, the, more of the heart on the ipsilateral side is getting dose, but the contralateral heart is going to get some dose. Uh, and then some dose is going to the contralateral lung as well. With protons, again, we can send the radiation and it all stops. So now two-thirds of the heart literally gets zero radiation. The contralateral lung literally gets zero radiation. And this is really the driver. I mentioned before when the first uses of IMRT for mesothelioma, when six out of 13 patients died from pneumonitis, this lung was already taken out. They were dying from damage to this lung. So even small volume dose to the contralateral lung in mesothelioma can be a big deal because we know the ipsilateral lung is not going to be physiologically either present at all if it was removed or what it was before after surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. Uh, lower down, IMRT is do doing a good job of, of giving most of the dose along the chest wall, but you're still getting some dose to both kidneys, the liver, and the bowel. But with protons, you really can just curve along the chest wall and you, you literally give zero dose to the bowel in the center there. So why should we be using radiation at all, and, and should we be considering local therapy? Well, yeah, I mean, local therapy certainly in a progression after surgery or chemotherapy can cause respiratory compromise that we can help with. Uh, so we've really started using salvage radiation for sites of oligoprogression in patients with isolated disease after systemic therapy remaining uh, to treat those areas. If it's small volumes of disease, we can use stereotactic body radiation, very, very high doses of radiation over just a couple of days. Uh, when it's larger volume or when we're using radiation more definitively, we're generally doing radiation just like for a lung cancer every day, Monday through Friday, over the course of five or six weeks. Uh, for non-surgical candidates, we've considered radiation and, and isolation, and I'll get into that in a second. Um, but the reason for considering radiation in the definitive setting for non-surgical candidates is this. So generally, mesothelium is thought of as a radio-resistant tumor, but that's actually not that true. The reason it sort of has that reputation is it's so difficult to deliver radiation for mesothelium. So if you think about where the lining of the lung goes, you have to deliver radiation and, and treat from above the clavicle to essentially the bottom of the liver. Uh, so the, the, the lining of the lung, the diaphragm, goes pretty darn low. When you treat that large of a volume of, of sort of, uh, and in general, you can cause a lot of toxicity. So we generally haven't until these last couple of years with the MD Anderson and Memorial experience. But if you actually look at the radiosensitivity of tumor, we all think that small cell lung cancer is the most sensitive solid malignancy for radiation, and it is. If you give just a single two gray fraction of radiation, uh, so you know this is generally only one thirtieth of the dose of treatment, you're killing literally 80 to 90 percent of tumor cells in just a single day of treatment. Whereas with non-small cell lung cancer, you're killing less than half of the tumor cells in that same day. When you look at mesothelioma, it's much more close to where we are with small cell lung cancer, that you're killing most of the tumor cells with relatively low doses of radiation. So this really suggests if you can deliver radiation safely, you can do a great job at killing mesothelioma. The other interesting thing, and this is a, a pretty complicated curve, but what it's essentially showing is most lung cancers, there's this little curve. You give a little radiation and you don't get much kill right away until you start to deliver higher doses of radiation. Small cell is more in a straight line, which means it can't really repair damage from radiation. So if you can deliver that low dose of radiation, you're still going to get tumor kill. Uh, so this is the patient that actually gave me the idea to start using definitive radiation a little bit more significantly. Uh, this is a patient that was actually intubated, uh, presented with large volume hemoptysis and respiratory distress, needed to get intubated, uh, was planning to be extubated terminally at the family's decision. We came in and said, well, why don't we try to just give palliative radiation three gray times 10, just two weeks of palliative radiation to see if we can get him off the ventilator or should they just proceed with uh, letting the, him die, unfortunately. 
when we did, we shrunk this tumor pretty significantly just in two weeks. And, and generally we think of small uh, mesothelioma like a sarcoma, we don't always see a lot of shrinkage with radiation, uh, but we did in this case. And because he had such good response, he was extubated after four days of treatment, we ended up going forward and, and he didn't have good other options. This was a sarcomatoid mesothelioma. We ended up treating him for four more weeks. So we treated a six week course of radiation. In doing so, this patient lived about three and a quarter years after radiation when he was going to get, unfortunately, terminally extubated in the ICU. So that gave me the thought, well, why don't we try to use definitive radiation a little bit more frequently? Uh, this was another example, and I'll stop with the, the one-offs in a second and, and pull some data together for you. But this is another example of a patient that flew to me from Florida. Uh, he had been on four different systemic agents, really didn't have any other options. And unfortunately, you can see Essentially, his entire hemithorax was taken up with disease. There's a 25 centimeter confluent mass is invading the descending aorta, so he had a huge amount of edema in the lower extremities. Couldn't swallow, um, really should have had a peg tube before he even came to me, but his esophagus was completely overturned with this tumor. Uh, tumors invading the pericardium as well. When I tried to think about how I can treat with IMRT, I really couldn't. Uh, I was giving such high dose, and, and I knew just giving a week or two of radiation wasn't going to control this. So I said, well, and then I try it with protons again. You can see again, the dose goes here, stops before we get to the most of the heart, the contralateral lung spared. So essentially what it allowed us to do, I was able to, to spare the, the, the mean lung dose in half. Uh, when I looked at the contralateral lung, it went from 10 gray to two gray of radiation. This is really, again, the marker of, of where we are with fatal pneumonitis in patients. Uh, the heart dropped from 45 gray to only nine gray with proton therapy. And then the stomach dropped by a third, uh, in two thirds, so from 36 gray to 11 gray, and I also reduced the dose to the esophagus. So I treated this patient, similar story, after just 20 gray of radiation, this tumor shrunk dramatically. His edema actually went almost completely away, and we ended up treating him for another three weeks beyond this. And he lived about a year and a half after the treatment, so it uh, was encouraging. So we pulled our early experience of using proton therapy together from Penn, we looked at treating 16 consecutive patients with 17 courses. That was a pretty advanced patient population. So 15 out of the 16 had stage three or four disease. We treated in relatively high doses, generally over five to six weeks of radiation. We actually did concurrent chemotherapy with four patients. So not something that's previously been described with mesothelioma doing concurrent chemo radiation. We do know that if you do concurrent chemo radiation with lung cancer, it has better survival than doing one after another. So we thought if we can reduce the side effects with protons, why don't we try to do it as well? Uh, and these patients generally were pretty advanced. So nine of them presented after they progressed on multiple systemic regimens. On average, they had two and a half to three regimens prior to radiation. And then we did treat seven in the adjuvant setting. Uh, one patient had biphasic, wasn't eligible for any trials, so we treated him definitively with concurrent chemo radiation with protons. And you can see in patients that uh, were receiving adjuvant radiation, we didn't reach the median survival. Uh, at, a, at about 30 months. So patients were doing pretty well in the adjuvant setting if they had surgery followed by proton radiation. Patients that came to us pro progressing on three lines of systemic therapy lived an additional 10 months after that from the time of salvage radiation. The nice story here though is even despite treating large volumes, there's not a single patient with a, a grade greater than two toxicity. We only had a, one patient out of those 17 courses with radiation pneumonitis. We started using protons even for stereotactic radiation, but again, this can apply to any type of photon stereotactic radiation. In patients with relatively small volume disease, this is a patient that had whole pleural radiation and then progressed outside of that area in the chest wall. This is a patient with, uh, who had surgery and progressed right near the diaphragm. Uh, we're starting to use these three to five fraction high dose radiation courses to salvage. Uh, this was an interesting one. I wasn't planning on using protons. I was planning on using photons for this patient. But because they had surgery, this was fixed. The bowel was essentially immediately intimate with the gross disease that was left. Uh, so I, I couldn't safely treat this area in just three or five days with photons. I would have needed to do it over about five or six weeks. And in a patient with a biphasic malignancy, I didn't want to put them through five or six weeks of, of treatment for just a small area. With protons, I was able to, to do it safely, completely spare the bowel in this case. I was able to do it so well, I actually was able to paint some of the radiation dose that I gave a much higher dose than I would have to the center of this area if I was going to treat with photons, and a lower dose to the, the lining of the lung around it to try to sterilize any potential other disease. I started now doing whole pleural IMRT, uh, and, and, excuse me, whole pleural intensity modulated proton therapy. 
Uh, and compared to, this is a picture from the publication that I mentioned from MD Anderson and Memorial Sloan Kettering. You can see they do a really good job of giving a low dose of radiation to the, the other side. So high dose radiation is sort of the green, uh, this red area. Green is what they wanted to treat. Red is high dose radiation. Blue is low dose radiation. But again, the whole heart is getting some radiation. Contralateral lung is getting some radiation. With protons, we're really not giving any dose to the contralateral lung, but the difference between these two, in addition to lowering the, the volume of, of normal tissues that's treated, with protons, you can see I'm actually able to treat the fissure, which here you intentionally don't do. The only way you can spare the ipsilateral lung is to try to make a rind in the center and, and tell the computer to avoid treating the center of the lung. And that's the only way we can safely do IMRT for these patients. Uh, but here, I can literally give almost no dose to the center of the lung and still treat fissures, because you know, it doesn't make sense. Why are we only giving radiation to the outside when we know there's lining of the lung and pleura in the center of the disease here? The other thing that's really nice is you can see this patient has pretty thick disease. So it's one thing to treat in the adjuvant setting when we can spare a relatively significant part of the center of the lung. Uh, but when you have a lot of thick disease, it's generally hard to give any sparing in the center of the lung here. Uh, but with protons, we're able to. So we presented at the IMIG mesothelioma meeting a few months ago, the first 10 patients we treated at ASTRO, the main radiation meeting that's coming up next month. Uh, we're gonna present now uh, 18 patients that we've treated since. But uh, when we looked at our first 10 patients, again, relatively advanced patients, and, and the difference with this versus the memorial experiences, most of these patients were treated in the salvage setting. So eight had failed uh, multiple lines of systemic therapy. Uh, one wasn't a surgical candidate, and one failed in, in multiple sites after surgery. So uh, a variety of diseases, but most importantly, nine out of the 10 had gross disease uh, at the time of radiation. And we can do it safely. So median follow-up was a little over a year in the series. All patients were still alive at a year, and we only had two out of the 10 patients have any failure in the ipsilateral hemithorax. So we did have a couple of patients fail outside of this area, uh, but I, I do think when we're doing radiation, we're actually changing the patterns of failure with this malignancy. It was tolerated pretty well. We didn't have uh, any grade three esophagitis or heart issues. We only had uh, two episodes of pneumonitis out of the 10 patients. That's led us to now start what is going to be a three-center trial. Maryland and Penn are up and running, and MD Anderson's going to be joining us. This is a multi-center phase one or two trial of using whole pleural intensity modulated proton therapy with concurrent chemotherapy for patients with malignant pleural mesothelioma. So combining radiation to a large, large volume with chemotherapy. We're looking at patients with all histologies, uh, even ECOG2, so a little bit poorer performance status patients are going to be eligible. Because this is a, a pretty risky treatment, this is the one thing uh, out of all this talk where I'd say protons and photons are not interchangeable. I wouldn't do this trial with IMRT doing concurrent chemotherapy. I think it would be just too risky to do that. Uh, but again, because we're not giving much dose to the contralateral lung or heart, I do think we can do it safely with protons. Uh, so this trial is just starting. It's just underway. Uh, we, are, we do have a lot of uh, radiation sort of quality assurance requirements to, to make sure this is safe. Uh, this is a general schema. We're starting with radiation to the entire lining of the lung. Uh, with just single agent pemetrexid. If that's safe, then we're gonna escalate and, and add in carboplatin. And if that's safe, we're gonna get to full dose chemo systemic dosing of carboplatin, uh, which is a higher dose than we usually use even for lung cancer. Uh, so pemetrexid with carboplatin and with whole pleural radiation therapy. So just in summary, the, these last two slides, uh, actually a little bit more. Uh, so this is looking at a new concept that a couple of groups are, are looking at in small numbers across the country of combining radiation with immune checkpoint inhibitors. So you heard of uh, these immune checkpoint inhibitors are really having an increasing role with mesothelioma. Radiation and, and PD-L1 and PD-1 drugs may have a nice synergy. We know that radiation can cause a, a rapid cell death of tumor. That can release neoantigens. If that's the case, we see that causes a lot of uh, recruitment of T effector cells. We also see the inflammation from radiation can cause a, a, a recruitment of T effector cells. That may allow immunotherapy to work better. The other interesting thing with uh, immunotherapy is right now we say about 40% of mesothelioma patients have PDL1 expression. It's a little higher in sarcomatoid patients. Radiation to a de novo tumor actually increases the PDL1 expression. So it's possible that now we give radiation, we increase this number, and those patients are more likely to respond to immunotherapy. Just getting back to protons, it may be an interesting synergy here. Um, this is a, a group that's looked in cells of mesothelioma, combining radiation, uh, comparing radiation with protons versus photons. Uh, 
if they irradiate tumor cells uh, and they look at what's changed, uh, what sort of uh, genes have changed before and after radiation, essentially everything's the same. DNA repair, cell cycle genes, they're all the same with protons and photons. The only difference is immune genes are more likely to be upregulated after protons and photons. So there may be some more synergy uh, with combining protons uh, than combining photons with pdl one drugs. So in summary, the, this is our current radiation approach. We're generally not giving adjuvant radiation therapy to the bulk of our patients who have a lung sparing surgery. The ones that we are giving radiation to are those that have gross residual disease, patients with multiple lymph node stations that are positive, patients with posterior intercostal lymph nodes that are positive, and then patients with really, really large tumor volumes. Those are the ones that we're seeing re are recurring very fast. So we're trying to give radiation to delay the recurrences in those patients. Certain patients that are uh, ineligible for surgery, and, and particularly those with biphasic and sarcomatoid histologies, we're starting to use definitive radiation, including with concurrent chemotherapy on the trial that I showed you. We're certainly using salvage radiation pretty regularly. So most of our patients now, if they have isolated progression, uh, whether it's after surgery or chemotherapy, we're giving radiation to just the areas of, of recurrence. And then we really transition the protons to just help with reducing side effects from patients. So in conclusion, we're using adjuvant radiation to try to sterilize microscopic residual disease after surgery, but we're really tailoring it to high-risk populations. Um, we're using it for salvage approaches as well. Mesothelioma is a radiosensitive tumor, so we're considering definitive radiation more and more. Uh, and then when we're really treating these large volumes, particularly when we're treating whole pleural radiation, uh, we really started using proton therapy to help protect normal tissues. Thank you.